This is Microphone Check, hip-hop from NPR Music. Quick note at the top of this week's episode. If you like what we're doing here, you might also like what they do at Fresh Air, an interview show hosted by Terry Gross. She talks to actors, directors, comedians, authors, and musicians, including, over the years, Grandmaster Flash, Melly Mel, Ice-T, Queen Latifah, Three Stacks, and Puffy. You can find Fresh Air at npr.org slash podcasts. This is Microphone Check, hip-hop from NPR Music. I'm Franny Kelly. I'm Ali Shaheed Muhammad. I'm Layla Steinberg. Layla Steinberg. Welcome, Thank you. Layla. Thank you. We are glad to be in warm California in January talking to you. Right. I mean, I am. It's beautiful <laughs> outside. 75, not bad. Good life choices get you to places like this. Hmm. I'm I still doing a rain dance, though. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdos, all of you. Um. So we wanted to talk to you about your history and what you're doing now, but I wonder if we might start with where you guys first crossed paths. Layla and I? Yeah. Um, My only recollection of the first time we met was at um, uh, Hammerstein Ballroom backstage. In New York. In New York. And this was, was it two years ago? Two years ago. It was two years ago? Oh, not bad, Two and Brain. Two and a half years. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it was the first concert of Earl Sweatshirt with Odd Future since his mysterious disappearance. His return from Samoa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. That was a big one. Okay. And I've We've crossed paths not officially for years because music and I'm a huge fan. So, and I was quiet, always in the cut. So there were many times I was places that people wouldn't know I was there. Right. I feel you. So. I identify with that. That's how how I like the role, too. I've been in your path so many times. You just didn't know. (laughs) The podcasts are for quiet people. Yep. That see you, though. (laughs) But that, that show... That was like my first coming back out into music in a long time in a work capacity. and After 20 years away, basically. Well, no, I'd say 10 years, oh, okay. really not active. At least 10 at that point. So, yeah. That, that show, that was interesting for me because of the relationship with my attorney, Julian Petty, who was also, I don't know what the relationship is with you and he's, Julian now. He's Earl's lawyer. Yeah. Okay. And um, I've been following Odd Future. And so when Julian asked me about Earl and linking up with him, I was like, cool. But um, just seeing him in that environment was like, it made me feel really aged. <laughs> <laughs> Only because, uh, but in a good way. Um, because I saw his nervousness. How how were you able to help him deal with that? Like, there was a lot happening in that moment. With, <clears throat> with Earl, there's, it's, what a journey. I wouldn't even know how to describe this journey. I'm thankful he gave me something back that I really appreciate. I love music. I think music is one of our most important vehicles on the planet, always has been. And so my work, my life has been in the development of art that can transform the planet. And so my introduction to Earl was so different because it was really through my work in law and my connection to his mom. So I came in as a parent, not as a music business person. And really, the plan was that I would help him transition into a healthy life back in L.A. pursuing his dream, but not that I would be really active in his business. And I think that because we have such a warped idea about business and it's a toxic world, the music business, that I realized as I wanted to transition out, that maybe I was supposed to be in here to help bring the lessons I learned from all the artists I loved and lost to Earl. So I haven't been able to leave. I've gone through all 
of the roller coaster ride with him as someone who loves him and as a family member that's now part of his musical family also. And there'll be a day that I won't be as active. I, I do see my active role as transitional, but I think we need more people like me in the business, I decided. <laughs> as I you know, copped out and left, I realized that I, I was doing a disservice and we have to reframe what we do with business and the arts. And, and so, yeah, here I am after a long leave. So can you tell us the story so that we can like make sure it's all out there accurately? The story of Layla and Earl. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can I can go and you can tell me what's wrong or which is like overstated. So somebody on the board at his school approached you? Well, I have a long relationship with Larry Bresner who has a film and management company. He basically started with Robin Williams, Billy Crystal. He's been in the business a long time, and he was very active at Earl's School, New Roads. And I've been working very closely with my nonprofit and professor, Jody Armour. He heads the department at USC. He's not just an educator in the law department and a law professor, but he's done a lot in music also. He's done some really amazing things. So there are all these intersections. And working with Jody, we studied a lot of Cheryl Harris's work, Professor Harris at UCLA, Earl's mom. mom. And so I wanted to connect with Cheryl for a long time and her work. And out of the blue one day, Larry Bresner calls me and says, Layla, I've got this kid from New Rose. There's been some issues. And and I want to talk to you. We need your help. I do a lot of intervention. People can call me any hour of the day or night. They have a kid that gets arrested in juvenile hall. They need intervention. They need guidance. So I've done a lot in navigating criminal justice and, and families. And so I went to a meeting, and it ended up being a meeting with Larry and Earl's mother. And the funny thing is I showed Earl's video a while before his first video in our class, our, in the law department, to talk about just the power of youth culture and one artist and the ability for that artist to drive movement and the intersection of punk and hip hop. And so I was commenting on this video and suddenly I'm in a meeting with a woman I've been <laughs> wanting to meet forever and admired her work. And Larry, telling me about this kid whose story I know because my son was a big Earl fan. And when I saw the video, I was like, wow. And then I began to study the whole OF movement. I have a son from the West Side who kept saying, Mom, you want to know about lyrics, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I, I don't know if I'm feeling this. So <laughs> I had a, a moment with my son, and, and I dived in, and I felt like I called him to me because his mom said that 
She really wanted to give him motivation to complete his program. He wasn't cooperating very well. There was a lot going on. Would I be interested in building a dialogue and maybe doing my curriculum and my workshop that I do, my mic sessions, with him through the phone and Skype and whatever, and I had never done this before. So I thought, what a challenge. And the other challenge was that I couldn't tell anyone, including my kids, because there was a big campaign to free Earl and where was he? And everyone I know wanted to know where he was. So <laughs> it was so intriguing. I couldn't say no, and I would have done anything for Cheryl. So that's really how it started. I said, you know, your son has to want to do something with me, and if he does and he completes his levels, I'll go get him. I just said that. I didn't know. <laughs> I always say things. I speak them. You know, Samoa, I hate flying. Oh, I'm really? terrified of flying. I fly all the time. But those 20-hour flights, oh, like God. South Africa, Samoa, I'm not feeling. So it's all the drugs. We had our first conversation, and he said, oh, I just read the Mike Dyson book. Someone had it in here. I can't believe you're talking to me. So we built from that first conversation. We began to have office hours every week. And he was like, you're really going to come get me? And so we made an agreement. I said that if he completed his levels and did the assignments and would write back and forth with me, I would come get him, but that he had to make arrangements that I could introduce my curriculum and my work in that facility. I could come do some workshops. And then in the facility, you always get a community service that relates to your issues. And a lot of the issues people had with Earl were around his lyrics and just the accountability and violence and sexual lyrics. And so he ended up having to work in a facility called Victim Support, which is the only center on the island that serves sexually assaulted youth. So every day he'd have to go and and spend time with these kids. And it was having a profound impact on him. And so hearing about it, I was like, I got to get to those kids too. So he made the agreement, and he kept telling me in doing so that the kids in the facility were going to hate me. <laughs> they won't feel, they're going to hate you. You don't understand. These aren't the kids you serve in, you know, struggling neighborhoods or juvenile hall, kids catching cases for gang issues or violence. These are privileged kids whose parents send them away and they don't want to hear you. So me, I know the power of music. I spent 20 years building this curriculum where I use art for emotional education and emotional healing, and you can penetrate any wall and anybody if you understand how to utilize the tools. So he completed his levels. He said he was ready long before I imagined a trip to Samoa, and... And I had to honor my word. And Larry and his mom were fully ready to support my going. They were like, go, take some time. And I said, no, I can't go without my team. I'm going to work. And it was really expensive to take 10 people to Samoa and document it. So I don't know how, but in three weeks, we raised the money, and we all got on a plane. And it was one of the most, I have to thank Earl all the time. I've traveled all over. But to be able to go to Samoa and actually spend time there, work there, and be embraced by a lot of the indigenous people. And one of the most powerful things that happened on that trip is I did a lot of work with gangs in Long Beach. So I had a kid from Long Beach who was in my group. He had a pretty hard history. His family was from the village that we were going to in Apia, but he had never been out of Long Beach. And... So I said, you know, we're going to the the village your family's from. We'll have to work pretty hard. My partner, Marisol, who's a teacher in Long Beach, did a lot of work so that he could get approved to go. But we brought him with us to the village his family's from, and Earl was his guide in his home. So Mm -hmm. it was really amazing. And, you know, just to take all the kids I brought from... L.A. and around, you know, there were other kids from outside of L.A., but this group of artists who got to have the experience of service and just, it was so deep. It was beautiful. I want to go back. (laughs) You make me want to go. It it was an amazing place. So, yeah. So then when you got 
back. Um, okay, so first of all, I, I read somewhere, I can't remember where, that when you guys landed at LAX, the cops were screaming Earl's name. Uh, yeah, that was really crazy. That's was... bananas. How many people? Everywhere we went. He left and he wasn't right. a celebrity, and he came home. Not only was he isolated and had no technology available for a year and a half, but his friends were all famous. He um, was in a position where he had to navigate a very difficult relationship with his mother and her feelings about the group. She was really vilified because she just wanted to help her son. She felt like he was in trouble. And I'm a parent who, uh, my daughter that's 28 now, my grandson's about to be 10. Out of all my kids, she's the one that put me through the most. And amazing, beautiful young woman that had a time where I was like, I could lose my daughter. So as a parent, you do what you have to do. And at that point in time, removing him from people, places, and things, and saying you're going to finish school, you're not going to abuse your body, you're, you're going to get focused, was what she did. And his friends didn't understand that because they're kids and they miss their friend. And so I'd say one of the roles I also played was, you know, helping mediate relationships. And I'm still doing it because there's so much pain when you grow and you grow apart at times and you have to come back together. So you have a large group of, you know, it's a huge collective. And at different points, different people get the attention. And that's some of the work I want to do in developing artists now is just to really help artists understand their humanity and power and what happens when you get power quickly and, you know, just the process of money. Right. And so that's the Earl. <laughs> I have I have one more question about this, and I'm sorry. I know I'm um, – so – you, but you were vilified also. Oh yeah, for sure. I remember the boards on February eighth, twenty twelve. Yeah. Um. So. So what happened was, is he he put up like a teaser video, and he said, "I'll give you the whole song if if I get to fifty k followers." And the internet just like loses their minds. First of all, whose idea was that? Because it was, like, it was just so adept. Well. There's a, I have such a large collective of young people that I mentor in my mic sessions, and I actually met a young man named Asher Underwood who runs Truth About Tupac, the website. And what I realize is when we lose people, we have to think about how to, to maintain their legacy and especially someone like Tupac. And so... There are all these kids who are devoting their life to his legacy. And I like Asher because he was committed to the truth about Tupac. And he had a real um, great sense of technology and in a way that I will never and don't care to. But he didn't try to appease me. And he, in his seeking truth, it wasn't a one-dimensional truth. So out of everybody that I've seen that wants to grow the legacy... Even in how he approached me, he asked me questions I didn't like, things that were uncomfortable. And so I began to reel him in and pull him in just because I think that we have to let the – it's youth culture, so we have to give them their voice and get out of the way. So when I was going to get Earl, I, would, I started talking to Asher just about, you know, it's scary when you've been away and you have to jump in and deal with technology. And I wanted to – give Earl the opportunity to think about how he wanted to grow his career, but to get his fans and and he have ownership. And so I asked Asher, and he's the one that did that and came up with the plan for Earl to, to get everybody to follow him, but not um, to do anything but to have a landing place, because I knew that the guys in Odd Future did a lot. They worked their butts off for him to have an opportunity. And so they had to be validated also. Even though they felt like I was the enemy and who is this whoever coming to take him, I always wanted to find a way to bring everybody to a place where they were all validated, all communicating, and move forward. And so 
you know, Chris, I went through a lot with Chris and Kelly. They worked really hard. I totally understood why people were mad and, yeah. and had issues with me. And because the other thing I would always encourage people to do, and I'm not a good example, I'm pretty much the hypocrite here, but if you don't tell your own story, other people will tell it for you. Mm -hmm. And I've been silent so much because I don't like the media and so many times things were misrepresented that I didn't do justice to to my part in the truth and I don't want to do that anymore. And so because I didn't communicate and other people virally started seeing things and I was not allowed to talk about what I was doing. So I couldn't talk about it. And then I think what happened was Ray Love, who is my dear friend and who is really the reason I worked with Tupac, he got so excited because he felt like Earl was so gifted and he found out I was going to Samoa and he said something on Twitter, which was really, he was excited and wanting to empower me. It wasn't exactly accurate because nobody got the information directly from me. And then rightfully, OF was like, what the? What did he say? Something like, oh, now Earl's part of the family, or some oh. kind of whatever. And he already had a right. family okay. here. Mm -hmm. So it was weird. And it was probably good because it forced the conversation faster. And mm -hmm. we all had to sit down and have an emotional, he say, you blame, whatever. Yeah. And, and I love all of them. You know, I've built a close relationship with many members of the group. Some I don't know as well. Haji used to come to my mic sessions long before there was an OF. I taught at the school that Tyler went to. It's crazy. We started realizing that we were all in the family. So. Yeah. Nigga. 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 Bitch. Well, I mean, so, and this is my last question about this, but, um, so Professor Harris is vilified. Sorry. She's a professor, right? Yes. Yeah, she's yeah. actually, um, UCLA. Right. Okay. She, um, so Professor Harris is vilified. You're vilified. In a weird way, they were both you were both taking care of him, and then you went and got him. You freed Earl. I mean, Earl freed himself mm. with some assistance from you. And what is it like to move in a world, and I, by world I don't mean like rap world or even the industry. I mean like everybody's everyday world, like society, American society, Um to try to be working with people who are disrespectful to you, like, constantly. And, like, that was the feeling in the forums was that you were the enemy and that also Earl had no agency. Like, Earl couldn't possibly have made this decision on his own. Um, Earl was in a really difficult position because he had his mom here. He had a music family and his family and nobody really understands how painful it is 
to sit at that crossroads. And I think that when I told you earlier that I was always identity challenged and racially challenged in our family, and I have a father who um, came from a Polish family. They immigrated, Jewish. And my dad married my mom very young. My mom's family immigrated from Mexico. I'm first born here. She's got family from Turkey, Middle East. So we have this very interesting family. And then my father remarried 30 years ago, a black woman. So I have a black stepmother, mixed kids, and many family members on either side that were never okay with these unions. So when you come in in conflict, you either are damaged and you let the pain affect you or you step outside and, and take these challenges and realize your work is in making a difference in these areas. So I would say that I've always navigated that territory. I've always been kind of in a position to either be a voice and help mend the situation or not do anything. And so I think that some of us are born and that's part of the work we do in this life. With Earl, because of the lack of understanding and what happened early on, there wasn't much budging on either side. I think that to be his mother, I would never be okay until I got some sort of acknowledgement and apology. And, and in a forum that the conversation started. So she was really hurt. Her son at some point has to defend his mom if he knows her decision was right or not. Remind me to tell you about Ted Nugent's son before we're done, because it reminds me of, <laughs> of right you know, we, we at some point have to stand with our parents or stand up. And so in this situation, Earl knew that his mother did what she felt was the best thing for her son. So it complicated it because he didn't articulate it the way that he might have needed to at that time for his friends to understand. So there was this big lack of communication and a kid, because he's a kid when he got back, being pulled both directions. So what he made the decision to do, because he was in a position to do a deal anywhere. They did the work, which we all know, and built their following up and helped him be in a position to go get a deal. What he chose to do was do a deal that would allow him to be part of the family where they would benefit. He spent the last two years doing any and everything pretty much that they asked. But also, he had to have some autonomy so his mom could feel that he handled his business and did what he was supposed to do. So being in a position where you're pulled from both directions, he sat in the middle and kind of worked to bring everybody to him. And he's still working it out. It's not all worked out. It's a lifetime journey to be a strong communicator, anyone who masters communication can have anything they want. So I think they did better than some of the evolutions of the groups that I worked with early on because things got really volatile. With OF, they're all finding their own voice, but everyone's at least still communicating. So good job, everybody. That answer? <laughs> it makes me wonder why you're not called, or maybe you are called on to be a part of uh, musicians' careers in that regard, especially groups. Because as you're speaking, I'm sitting here thinking about my own group and, you know, the breakdowns, the breakdown in communication and how we were able to overcome that, but how um, we, we were a little bit older, you know, but often you are younger and don't have those faculties to be able to manage the situation. And I'm thinking of everyone else from EPMD, Fuji's and stuff like that. And it just makes me wonder, are you called more often? No, not really. You know, I don't think we look at, and as we look at race and we look at 
the truth about education and how dysfunctional we are. I think that white males primarily are conditioned to seek everything possible for advancement, mm -hmm. whether it's business growth and planning to strategies for families to getting therapy. And so mm -hmm. in the communities that I grew up in, you know, therapy is like, no one wants to get therapy. We don't ask for mediation. We don't go take the classes that would advance us. It's very hard to invest in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I would say that Tupac was an amazing teacher for me as one of the first artists I work with because he was so brilliant and he read so much. He was all about learning strategies, but he was still too young to implement. He was in a real studying space. But he motivated me to understand my power and that I sat in a really... Um, key position to be at the tables people couldn't get at, to get into doors that were difficult for others. And I didn't appreciate my privilege. I ran from it. And Tupac really um, told me off. You know, at a when I first started working with him, I never went after anybody. I was a, an artist in my young motherhood days <laughs> in high school. I always wanted to be in the band. And my mom left when I was young. My dad raised me. My mom moved to the Bay. So my dad, as my primary parent, raised me kind of like his oldest son. So I got some great messages from having a man raise me. But um, I didn't necessarily have a sense of worth and, and value in the ways that that I needed to really have success. And so I always vacillated. I wanted to do everything, but I never just felt like I'm gonna put 200% in. So I was in bands and I was a young mother and I went to school for sports therapy. I work with athletes in the 80s. So when I met Tupac, I had little girls and he was like, how are you gonna really parent and be the parent that you wanna be and not the parent your mother was? And run around in a band. You say you want to touch the world and you want to do, you got to learn business and I could be your first business. And so I was like, that's crazy. I don't know anything. I'm not good at business. Can I couldn't... we just say really quickly that at this time he's 17 and you're 25? Yeah, that's something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he definitely was older than me. And I said, no, I couldn't do it. Wouldn't know how. And he was like, are you kidding? Your last name, the access you have, you understand art, you have everything it takes. Read some books. So that was my beginning of transitioning into doing business for people. And it was guided by, it was all needs based, someone that needed me to do something and thought I could do it, convinced me, and, and I did and kept going.
Can you tell a story of a specific time? Because I, I wrote down um, that, no, I don't have it right here, but you told XXL um, like four years ago, he made me the white woman that he needed me to be when I needed to be that, or the Mexican woman who spoke Spanish. Do you have a specific memory of a time when you're like, okay, today I got to do this, I got to oh be this? Oh my gosh, I, all the time. We wanted to have his first show at the Santa Rosa Fairgrounds. It's a great place. My, and this is where it really started, but my ex would try to rent facilities and he'd go and say, I want to do a show. How much is it? And they were always booked. We could never get a facility. So... I began to be, hi, I'm Layla Steinberg. I'm doing an event to benefit kids. Da, da, da. And suddenly the date would be open. And we began to document the many times that Tupac or Bruce or Ray or people that um, were young and black couldn't get access, couldn't get a facility, couldn't get an interview, and how easy it was for me to walk in and get that same place for rent, that apartment, that car, that loan. And the funny thing is, my credit was often not as good as some of the young black males that were turned down just on appearance. So I don't know if that was specific, but <laughs> it was. It was plenty. I'm going to pause for one second here. Sorry for the interruption, but we need to spread some love. If you like what you hear at Microphone Check, we recommend you give NPR's Fresh Air a try. That show got me through quite a few envelope stuffing internships and was the occasion for the first time I met Jay-Z. He came through our office to do that interview when he was on his high-end publicity tour for Decoded. And if you haven't heard Terry Gross's 45 Minutes with him, you should fix that. You can find Fresh Air at npr.org slash podcast. And back to Layla. I'm just wondering, with do you still have microphone sessions I do how are you able to convey to I don't know the, the type of kids that come to um, your session first of all are there older people that come in so in, in just for volunteer yes just just so I can put this out you can find out about my nonprofit at aimfortheheart.org and I've been doing workshops for almost 30 years now. It's been a long time. I never stop. I had class last night. And the great thing is that I now have a curriculum. I do a training once a year. And so it it happens whether I'm there or not. Someone last month said when my son taught the class, he was so much better than me. And I had to laugh. So it means that we have a process that works. It's... Um, kind of the intersection. It's kind of like me and who I am. So I have kids that come from privilege, kids that come from poverty, kids that are still active in gangs, kids that have never seen outside of Brentwood. And I have 13-year-olds and 60-year-olds. And it's like, you know, going to church or temple or the mosque. You have everybody there. And our common denominator is our love of art and whatever the word of the week is. So this week it's direction. So there might be a classical artist or an opera artist or a rapper and everyone has to marinate on that same word. And then we have a conversation through our art as a group. And you know, kids come for artist development. I still believe in artist development, but I believe everyone's an artist, whether you're a lawyer, doctor, whatever it is, and that we have to live our lives understanding that whatever our passion is is our art and how do we craft a life around that and so they don't know they're coming to class for emotional education or emotional literacy but as we look at the issues right now that are most prevalent the two areas we're most damaged in is our hearts and our pockets like as a people globally we have everybody has a damaged heart all we want is to feel value and loved I mean at the core of every human being, that's all that matters, and we need to sustain ourselves and survive. So I'm definitely not the model for financial education, but it's as important as emotional, but I understand that geography very well. And so I've packaged a way to teach kids and put words to feelings, 
and navigate those feelings so that we can manage our pain and behavior and we don't have to shoot up schools and act out. And suddenly, when you become human beings to one another in a shared space, it makes it hard to go outside on the block and see your neighbor as an enemy. And I've worked so much with gangs. And my dad was a criminal defense attorney. He raised me around criminal defense and the imbalance in our laws. And so I really had a front row seat. I was very groomed to understand this dynamic. I still work in San Quentin. I have a program with the Lifer since 1990, No More Tears. So I'm all about bringing balance and truth to these very painful subjects. I'm sure that you've made such an impact in ones that, you know, may be highlighted in a famous sense like Earl, like Tupac. Um, maybe there's some others that we don't know about. I'm wondering, because you said something earlier about how there's a difference in what is taught based off of race. And so not necessarily for the people who come who are able to impact and interact with you and benefit from uh, the environment that you have created, but more so the outside people who may be looking in or you may have some sort of relationship, do they really understand that there is a lack of opportunity um, from an emotional sense, from an economic sense, that it's not it's not an excuse, that it is something that's really blocking uh, different people, t- you know, young, race, black, Hispanic, um, and that is a real, it's not like a, a facade, it's tangible. It's, it's why I do the work I do. It's so painful for me. It's so imbalanced, and I am so tired of even my own family members. Oh, it's choice. No, it is not choice. Choice is based on your formative opportunities and access to things that we don't have any balance in. I know, I lived on 64th in Vermont, and I lived on Las Flores Beach in Malibu as a kid. I know how hard it was to let go of my friends and the guilt I felt because my father had a booming criminal law practice, was a very young lawyer, and we had upward mobility. And I began to see that when you go to school in Santa Monica, or you're in Malibu at a really young, oh, my God, they live like this? Have there been any, like, maybe from a, a corporate level or maybe from a legislative uh, position who understand that and who has been quietly instrumental in helping bring forth change? Very, very little. It's really difficult, and I don't want to point or shine light on specific names but there and that's why I I love all the artists I've worked with Pac losing Pac at the time that we lost him was so detrimental because he really got it and he wanted to serve that cause and he's been to date like one of my only funding sources because all the money from the rose that grew from concrete that I get on my side of it strictly to programs for youth. And it's like, I have a couple artists now that I really think could be like that big that we could get legislature and get support, but it's very difficult. Once you get to a certain level, you get quiet and you're so controlled by the alignments you have with brands or whoever's sitting on top of you that no one's forcing these issues. And it's one of the most important things we could do. No. I'm doing the work every day. We need a lot more, a lot more involvement. And that's what, you know, drew me. I never thought I'd be interested in law, having a, a father who's a lawyer. And I don't know how I found my way to Professor Armour, but I've been co-teaching with him at SC, the race and stereotypes class in the law department. And all the work I did in San Quentin has me thinking that, you know, my next 
my next work will probably be in law and and that I have to come full circle. Well, and, I certainly hope that you don't shy away from that because it, from what I've learned in this short conversation is that um, you seem to maybe uh, put up your own blocks. <laughs> and um, and I, I understand that. I myself learning to not do that and be that. So in hearing um, of all the wonderful things that you have done and that you do still, um, if that comes knocking, it it would be a great it would be a great reward for everyone. Really. I'm thinking. I'm just like, wow, back to school. But um, you know, that's where a lot happens is in policy and. Yeah, absolutely. I think I I believe the only way to really affect change in America is to vote people in or out of office um, without being extremely radical, you know, and that is as radical as you can be actually here. And so um, we have these moments, I think, in history where people kind of seem like they get it. Um, And I think that there's such a letdown after people are in office and... I don't know if it's due to politics or that they're really not about transforming that things don't happen. But certainly after seeing, you know, the the police brutality, which has been going on for a number of years, but it's turned up a bit more lately that we carry these marches over into the next election in a great way. That's even like in talking again about bringing truth to, like, the history of why it's so dysfunctional between the public and the police. The inception of policing was racist. We policed black people during slavery. That's why police were formed. It wasn't, here's the peace union or the protect you union. It was to police a specific group of people. We've never resolved that. We've never had any healing around it. And so the institution and the process is racist, and and you can see it. And maybe in certain cities we've worked through some of it, but we have a lot of work to do with those that are supposed to guard and protect the community and enforce morality. And then the, the ideas around blame and punishment so th- that's why I'm so drawn to the law and how we set precedent and policy. So I come back to artists because it is only through artists' voices that we impact these discussions, that we can get radio. Or Do, do you believe in complete artistic license or do you think that there's a line that should not be crossed? I, I'm challenged with that a lot. I think that... Um, that we violate people just by speaking certain things. And so if in somebody taking license to say whatever they want, they are um, serving to destruct, I don't think it's okay. And that's why I um, said the Ted Nugent comment. (laughs) I... um, I've been challenged recently because this kid, white kid, very talented, ended up in my workshop. Anybody can come to my workshops. Word of mouth, you have to find me. And um, so Rocco, Rocco Moon is his artist name, but Rocco Nugent is his name. And he's got a lot of talent. He's a great video director, and he's a rapper. So it was very hard for me and I'm being honest and talking about this, I guess it's okay because it is what it is, but I felt my inability to embrace him because of who his father was. Or I felt and still feel, it's my struggle, I had him come to the law class because he's been bugging me, kind of like the same kind of bugging me Tupac did. I want to work with you. I came out here from Texas. Like Tupac was my 
And I'm like, you're go with your dad and his TV show hunting in Alaska and you know I haven't heard you publicly make a statement that says I love you dad but this is not okay so for me in order to make peace with or embrace Rocco he has to be able to speak out and and his dad is just you know not okay and so how do you do that? And how do we break the cycle? And maybe his son was sent to me. Maybe there's a reason that, you know, he's over with a room full of rappers every week. And so, I mean, that's that deep-rooted years and years, and I'm getting their kids, and, mm. and I'm struggling with my own prejudice. So, Well, maybe to ask it from the other side, who... Who do you think is emotionally educated, and how can you hear it in their music? Oh, I mean, are you just talking about artists or people? Because there are a lot of leaders that this is their life's work. Oprah spent her life processing her pain so she could be a voice. We're celebrating, and, you know, people are going to see Selma. There are, you know, Deepak. Michael, there there are all these people doing the work of emotional education and healing on the planet. There are amazing ministries. Not all, you know, but but there are those that do the work. There are a lot of artists now who are still in the mix because they've been able to work through and process their pain, their past, and who they are and what they're doing. We've lost a ton of artists to addiction. We have athletes who, at the top of their game, have fallen apart, and that's that emotional disconnect that, you know, there's no reason you're in the NFL at the top of your career and you're sitting in jail now fighting murder cases. So we have to examine how people that have everything still go off the cliff and what is everything so then they don't have everything and that's all I'm saying is that from K through 12 we have nothing in formal education that says I need to understand anger I need to understand temptation I need to like mm. find a path to friendship and to love we need it doesn't have to be mine I just put something together that really works and now I need to get it out, whether it's free or whatever it is. That's the next stage of my work is how do I get this process in the hands of every social worker, every teacher, every therapist, because I spent 25 years examining how to change behavior permanently and how to break our own internal cycles. And I did it. You know, I had very violent relationships. I was definitely drawn to whatever I could get my dad's attention, not consciously, but my dad worked in crime, you know, rap music, the streets. <laughs> uh, you have so much to say, and unfortunately, dude, is we have another interview that's supposed to uh, be here at 3 o'clock, and there's so much more that I know Franny, she'll speak for herself, but I'd love to ask you, and um, hopefully you can come back before um, we do end the interview. For now, I want to ask you about your son, Naiku, <laughs> who I had the pleasure of meeting. And uh, I first experienced him through his video. Um, I can't remember the name of the song. Do you remember the, what song is it? Traffic. Traffic. <laughs> N-Y-K-U, Traffic. And... Um, I was really impressed by that, and it reminded me of the hip-hop that I grew up on, first of all. So um, to know that he's 15 and making music like that now at this time period was really impressive.
Take a second to look around and get to know the view. Cause any second you could disappear, nobody remembers you. You just another hood nigga with hood dreams that ended up dying at 17. That's why you gotta explore and live your life and live your life. Cause most niggas wasted all one night. The gun strap held up high. One shot, two shots, three shots. Where you from? What's up, nigga? I heard you pull that trigger. Now you incarcerated, being self educated. I bet you wish you could have took it back. Cause your mom was bond and conscious, told you it was right, nigga. You foolish. This ain't a game. This real life for niggas fighting for their lives. Foolish niggas with the tools, you better think twice. Think right, get your mom white, get your mom right, and manage to survive in this cold world. Cause the world is cold, even on a sunny day. And we all praise the God and call him Savior. Well, how is he a Savior? If your mama got a tombstone and baby's getting buried for no reason. I know this life's hard and it keeps getting harder, but don't complain about it. Make it easier, stay positive, cause positive stays. Negativity is how you keep falling. Stop, drop, and roll, yo. Cruising through traffic with these rhymes, haters on the road. Um. How is it raising a up and coming MC? I'm trying to figure it out. We're fighting a lot. That's another area I'm a little hypocritical in. Because if it was anyone else's kid, I would be like, oh, he has it. And then because I know the industry, I'm like, no, this is not happening. And so what he did was he found somebody that was very interested in him in the industry already. That really wants to work with him. Had him at Interscope and a couple places, and he said he wants me to focus on being his mom, and I can protect him. But he really doesn't want to work with me in in any kind of business capacity. So it's very interesting. I'm thinking about it. I'm very <laughs> controlling, but um, he's also he has so much pain and so much that he's been through. You know, our family's been through a lot. And so, I'm really、um, knowing that he is my son,、mm. and I hear it in his lyrics. And he has something special, so I want to support Naiku. I think that he、um, he does have a gift. But there's, can I mention one other artist? Sure. I I just want to say that, like Tupac, I knew instantly. There was no doubt. And when I went, you know, to get Earl, it was because I know there's something very special. I usually, you know. Have the good radar. Actually, I've never been wrong, but I've spent ten years kind of growing a relationship with the artist Hope. Do you know the artist Hope? No.、Mm-hmm. She's got. She's Wayne Shorter's niece, Hope Shorter,、oh、and her record is coming. I'm so excited to be part of it, and they're going to launch her first song on a platform called Mazuka. It's a new platform. It's kind of the answer, like to iTunes, but it's free. I'm not very good with all the platforms, but、yeah. Mazuka is going to launch her first single, and you have to listen. Hope's going to change the world with her voice. How、and、how can we find her? You can go to the artist Hope just to see her old stuff. She's got a lot of stuff that she did that more the acoustic stuff, but you know when you get that artist that. That you're like, oh, this one has a voice that you've got to work with her. Hope is amazing.、Mm-hmm. I haven't heard a voice like hers. It's one of a kind. Wow. So, for my one plug of the day, I'm really excited about Hope. That's、oh. what I think. You know, after the Earl's record is coming. Okay. It's coming. It's very insular. It it's like the beginning of his coming、hmm. into the 21 year old. Earl, that was fast. That's what I thought. <laughs> was I was just like, wait a second. <laughs> Thank、blank. you guys for having me. This is、Thank、awesome. You. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Yeah, we'll do it again. Really、I、appreciate、soon. it.